Jesus was a rock star. He brought the day. Bless God. Would you pray with me? Would you say, Jesus, help me? To be what you want me to be? Do what you want me to do? Because people without you go to hell. Everywhere you look, people are trapped. They're addicted, they're stuck. They feel like they can't tell anybody they believe there's no way out. Turn after turn, you try everything, but nothing works. Everything seems to be a dead end. You feel stuck. You want to tell somebody, but you're afraid. What do you do when you feel like there's no way out? The good news is, even though you feel trapped, God will always give you a way out. Temptation, a way out. We're going to be looking at a Bible verse for the next four weeks, and that is that God will always provide. It is one of my least favorite uh, Bible verses in the scripture. Um, because it, it takes away all of my excuses, okay? There's lots of scriptures I can go to, and I can, I can point at Paul, and I can say, say, look, he struggled too. Look at David, he struggled too. And look at all this, and then I got this Bible verse that hits me right in the forehead, and it says, uh, but uh, you, there's, oh, God always provides a way out. So even though he, he, he gets me, and there's, there's nothing worse than feeling trapped by temptation. So my prayer is that this... Um, this month would, would be important for us, and, I'm, and we're doing it in the in the summertime because it's it's maybe not as um, it, it's maybe not as funny as maybe sometimes as, as we could be all, 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 all trying to be silly to light it up maybe I don't know but um, but but temptation is is, a, is an awful thing I'm not very good at temptation you'll hear me say that a lot over the next few weeks uh, I love that when I read the scripture. That when Jesus is praying and he gives us the model to pray. And he says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy kingdom will be done on earth. And give us the... But then it says, Lead us not into temptation. It doesn't say, Lord, please make me really strong in the face of temptation. No, but Jesus knew what in a colossal was I was. And, and he said, Lord, please don't even let Scott be tempted. Because Scott, he, he, it's just going to be hard for him. So, Lord, please lead us not, lead us not into temptation. And deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom. And so this feeling of being trapped, and some of you here today um, feel trapped by something, some sin that is dominating you. And it's really, really bad because what, that, what has happened is, is that has muted your Christian walk. You haven't felt worthy to lift your hands in worship. You haven't felt worthy to do the things that God has asked you to do because you've been tripped up because there's been a temptation that has been beating you down and you've been a slave to it. And I want to tell you, God does not want you to be a slave to that. And we can be encouraged by this, this verse that we're about to look at in a minute um, is because uh, apparently there, there must be a way. So whether you are being tempted with overeating whether you're addicted to gambling and, and, and you've been in situations where you put your family in, in terrible uh, circumstances as a result of gambling, whether you have a sexual addiction, something that, that you are just powerless against, maybe you have some kind of chemical addiction, and, 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 and you're, you're, you drink or you use and nobody knows. You, nobody even knows, but man, you get around your, your family, you get around you know, people at church, and, and it just it's what you think about. It comes to the front of your mind over and over again, lying. Uh, maybe, maybe you're addicted to social media. You can't get your nose out. It is so comical to watch whole families having lunch or uh, out to eat, and they're all like this. And, and grown-ups. You know, we were in Norway, and I looked up at one point, and they're like, you know, adult people, you know, with their noses in their phones instead of actually talking to each other. You know, maybe you're addicted. But we can't, we can't overcome these... Um, on our own. But scripture says we have a way. Now here's, here's my least favorite verse in all of scripture. Okay? I have lots of favorite verses. I have, this is my favorite verse. This is my favorite I'm always saying that, right? This is my least favorite verse in all of scripture. First Corinthians 10, 13. Because it, it puts me on the hook. Not only off the hook, it puts me on the hook. See, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 
No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And also, when Jesus Christ became a man, he became mankind. He became a human being. Every temptation that has assailed me, according to this verse, Jesus dealt with. Or he dealt with, dealt with the like. That, so he, he, he has empathy. He knows exactly the temptations. Common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, we looked at this verse about two months ago when we did our God Didn't Say That series. And because some people will misquote this verse and they'll say that God won't give you anything you can't handle. That is what this verse says. God actually loves to give you stuff you can't handle. That's kind of his thing. Uh, he loves to put us in situations that are bigger than we are. But the scripture does promise that he will always provide a way out of temptation. Now, today is going to be kind of an introduction. Okay? And over the next uh, three weeks, we're going to be looking at resisting temptation. And then we're going to take a look at the Spirit's power and, uh, and, in, uh, in, in temptation. And then finally, in three weeks, we're going to do uh, three things that every believer has to do in order to stand against and, and to endure and, and conquer temptation. So today is kind of an overview of those things, but I thought that we would we would nail this thing to the wall uh, nice and hard. Temptation, what is it? <clears throat> it's anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. When the enemy comes with you temptation, he makes it sound really good and he makes it sound really cheap. But once you've given in to temptation, if you've ever been there and you said, I'm never going to take this drug again, and you did it, when you said that I'm never going to go that place uh, in, in sexual things, and you did it, if you've ever been one that said, I'm not going to gamble anymore, and you went and you did it, it all, it's never as good as the devil told you it was going to be, is it? Like, like, like you get through it, and you get on the other side, and you're like, oh man, it wasn't even that good, you know? It's never as good as what was promised. And it always costs more than what you thought. The cost is always higher and the enjoyment is always lower. But what temptation is anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. <clears throat> and, and there's a chemical thing that happens in our brains. We, we get in this temptation cycle, and, and there's that, that thing of getting away with them, and, and it releases dopamine into our brains. That's that thrill. Uh, is, I think it's a hormone. It, it makes you feel, whoa. It's that moment when you go down a roller coaster, and you're, and you're feeling, whoa. And it's, that, it's that rush feeling. It's that rush feeling when you're at work, and you're just about to nail that. that you're about to make that sale. And you just, whoa, you feel that rush, okay? It's Pastor Scott when he's about to preach on, you know, Easter Sunday, you know? <laughs> A lot of people that don't come to church much you hear about Jesus today. You know, it's that moment when, when you're like, whoa, and, and your adrenaline is engaged. And, and, and we, get, we get addicted to this. So temptation, we do these things and then we get in a habit. But what happens? Well, if you've ever been addicted to something, you know that a lot of times the first time is the best you'll ever experience. The first time that you give in to some sin or you try something that you know is counter to what God has, that's about as good as it's going to get. It's all downhill from there. If you ever had the, um, uh, the misfortune of having somebody that you care about get into meth, it's, probably, it, it's illustrated so clearly. I mean, that high is so intense. And that crash is it's just so awful. And then and you, and you hear addicts talk like this. We're, we're chasing the high. You know, because you can't get that feeling back again. You know, it, it was so good that one time, but now it, it just leaves me feeling empty. But now I'm bound. I'm bound. And, and, and we're let down. And it comes in with this intense shame. And it, it's such an awful thing to live in, in, in this intense shame, because it makes us crawl in on ourselves. And there's so much guilt. There's four truths about temptation that I want to share with you today. Number one. It is not a sin to be tempted. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, We do not, for we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weakness. Remember, we just read that all sin uh, is all common to mankind. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. What? Yet he did not sin. 
There's a quote that I heard attributed to uh, John Wesley, Martin Luther, it was probably one of the disciples who said it first, um, and, and that is, I, I can't stop birds from flying around my head, but I can stop them from building a nest in my hair. You've heard that quote before? Temptation is not a sin. And, and the reality is, is we are all, we are all, we're all tempted. Maybe you're, um, you've got those cuss words flying around in your brain, you feel so dirty afterwards. You know, at least you didn't say that, okay? Or maybe you got that moment that you go and you smell. Have you, have you done, I've done this. I'm fasting. And, uh, and, and somehow when I, I, I'll, I'll come into the kitchen, you know, and I'm, I'm just hungry, you know? And so I'll, I'll drink pickle juice, you know, because it's a little salty, you know? I'll, I, I drink uh, hot sauce, and then, and then I'll go, and I'll, and, I'll, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll take out the peanut butter, and I'll go, oh. And then I'm like, I'm just going to take a, I mean, it's, it's kind of a liquid. If you put it in the microwave, it turns into a liquid, right? So now, you're not going to think I'm anywhere near as spiritual as you thought I did a minute ago, okay? Um, so Pastor Scott's past, fasting, oh yeah, he has a diet of peanut butter. Um, and, so, and, boy, and so then yeah, I'm just going to have a little bit, you know, <laughs> you have a little bit of peanut butter, and, and, then, it's, and then and I use the same spoon again that irritates my wife. And I, and, I, and I go, and then by the time it's done, I look in the peanut I, I, I think I just consumed 2,000 calories worth of peanut butter. You know, it, it happens so quickly and so easily. Maybe, it happened, maybe, maybe some of you this morning, okay? You came in and, and, and uh, you're like, oh, I'm going to be good this week, God. I'm not going to overeat, eat, you know. I want to I wanna be alive for a long time for my grandkids, and I'm not going to have any donuts. And you walk by, and the first thing, and, and you take the coffee, and I'm not going to have any donut in the And then you walk away, and then you're like, oh, you know, Pastor, he, he forgot to lower the order for donuts for the summertime. So there's a lot of donuts out there, man. You know? I mean, he doubled the order a while ago in the summer, but now there's, there's been more. So I, I, Pastor needs me to help him. Because we can't let these donuts go to waste. Because letting food go to waste, you know, is a sin. And so I have to have, I have to eat these donuts. And have you ever, have you ever been like, you get hungry and you go to the store and you don't just get one, but you eat three donuts? Have you ever done it? And then I, I, they taste so good going down, but you're never glad you did it. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's just, donuts are just like sin. You know, that's why we're giving you sin today. It's, uh, uh, it's um, they, they, they taste so good, but, but you, after you get done eating a donut, you're never feeling you're sitting there all bloated going, oh, I'm so glad <laughs> I ate three donuts this morning at church. You know, it's, it's never happened. My kid never eats lunch on Sundays. She's just full of donuts every, every day. <clears throat> But when we come in and, and, and whatever you've been trying to resist, then that uh, we give in that feeling of hope, hopelessness comes. And, but if you didn't do it, you shouldn't feel guilty. Don't let the enemy put guilt on you. You didn't earn. Okay? So number one, there, there is, it's not a sin to be tempted. Everybody, everybody is tempted. And so it doesn't mean go hang around and go get tempted. Remember, and we'll be talking about that more as the weeks go on. Uh, avoiding temptation is always the best policy of, of temptation. Because you are never above temptation. Okay? We read this. <clears throat> so if you think you're standing firm, be careful so that you do not fall. If you think you're standing, if you think that you're good, okay, the moment that you think that you're strong, be careful. Okay? Because uh, there's trouble around the door. Around, around the corner. And that's why my little cliche that I say to myself, and you hear me say over and over again, is I say I am not good at temptation. Well, where, do, where does that... Uh, I might think I'm strong. Maybe I haven't been tempted in an area for a long, long time. You know? Maybe I haven't been tempted to... Um, you know, I, I've just been real good. And then all of a sudden, in my message box, I, I get messaged by a, a girl I used to date. And there's a little something in the back of my mind that says, you know, that's probably not a good idea. But, but I, I mean, we've been married like 4,000 years now. 19 years. Yeah. And, 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 and this is not, you know, it's never been a So I'm just, and you begin, you, you allow that temptation in because it's never been a problem for you. The moment you think you're tough is the moment the enemy can try to trip you up. And so I want to encourage you that it is actually a real benefit to you and the kingdom of God 
to just know and assume and act like you are a complete wimp when it comes to temptation. No place in the scripture does it tell us to go out and seek out and allow ourselves to be tempted. We're supposed to flee temptation. That's what Joseph had to do when he ran away from Pharaoh's wife. That's what uh, Paul told Timothy to do. He said, flee the evil desires of youth. Jesus said, lead us not into temptation. So we have to deal with temptation. But it's just stupid to go looking for it. And the moment that we think that we're strong and we think we can go to that place and not be tempted, because the last three times I wasn't tempted. I went to, you know, I, I, I don't drink anymore. I've been going to the bar and I haven't gone to drink at all. You know, and, and, and I wasn't even tempted. You know, the enemy's smart. If there's something that he has been trying to use to kill you in your life, one of the best things he can do is he just back up. Say, hey, look at how you've grown. Look how strong you are. You're, you're not even tempted at all. You were alone with that girl. You know, you're, you're dating this girl, and you guys, you guys just sat on the couch and watched movies all night long and didn't touch each other all night. You know? And, and it was easy. You weren't even tempted. And then, but then, I'm going to share with you, close your, your ears, wife. She just does not like this. My wife has never sinned. Um... But this is hard for her to hear. But I, I dated girls before my wife. Now, we were both virgins when we got married. Um, but I did date some girls before we were married. And, 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 and this is how it would go. I had no, I did not plan on sharing this. I, actually, I thought of sharing this, and then I decided not to share this. And now I'm doing it. Um, it's the spirit, baby. I'm Pentecostal. That's what we do. You can't blame me. It's God. Uh, the, uh, but you'd be dating a girl. And, and, I, and I didn't, you know, I, I knew that God didn't want me having sex with her before we were married. We were Christians and Bible study and all these things. And so we'd get together and, 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 and there'd be no temptation. And, 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 oh, you know what? This isn't so bad. I can do this. And, but then all of a sudden you'd be, you'd be sitting in that car that night, be just the two of you, and that temptation would come down like a hammer. Boom, boom, boom. And, and, and it's like, you were, and, and there are times when you feel completely powerless in the face of temptation. And, and I don't know, maybe some of you have experienced this. I have. You're, there's, you're, you're in a situation, and, and, and you weren't tempted the last ten times. But now, all of a sudden, you're in that temptation. And it crashes into you like a freight train. And, and, and you give in, and you're like, man, I... And maybe you even pointed at this verse. And he said, God, you said you'd give me a way out. You see, there was no way out, okay? God, I was there, it hit me in the forehead, and I, I, I didn't even have a minute where I took when I when I thought about it. I just did it, God. That temptation came and I just I just did it. Well, this is your way out. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. The moment you think you're tough, you're not. The moment you allow yourself into that situation because the last ten times you weren't tempted, and now you think you're really something strong, well, I'm I'm more spiritually mature, I can handle that. That's the moment that the devil's going to pull his punches until he's got you set up and then he's going to come like a freight train. And so in those moments that maybe you had that experience where you said, I had no way out. There was zero chance of me resisting that temptation. This, is, this was your way out. It's because you thought you were tough and you allowed yourself into a situation where God did not want you. You went someplace where you shouldn't have gone. And by the time you got there, your way out was back there someplace. Maybe by the time you're there, you're sunk. You have no chance of resisting that temptation anymore. God, where was my way out? Well, Sky, your way out was when you had three... When I dated my wife, this is how my... It was her roommate's mission in life not to let us be alone. Yeah, remember that? And, uh, yeah, and so she was there all the time. And that was actually not the worst thing ever. Um, and it's, it's helpful, to be perfectly honest, because my wife is hot. <laughs> She's still kind of smiling, okay? Um, I haven't crossed the line. I have crossed the line before, and that's, if you ever heard the Hogan Doss ice cream saved my marriage, that's that what happened. Anyways, and I'm going to not tell any more of that because I'm going to get in trouble here. Let's go to the next slide. You recommend that? <laughs> God isn't the one who does the tempting. God never tempts you. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me, because God 
never tempted to, to do wrong and never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from the devil because the devil made me do it. No, that's not what it says. I hate it when the scripture doesn't let me off the hook. Um, temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. Man, we got to quit pointing out and say, they made me do it. The way she dressed made me do it. This made me do it. That made me do it. No, it's our evil desires inside us that entice us. And how does it do us? Because we start running this dialogue. We start explaining to ourselves why we're strong enough, why this is the right thing to do. And we, have, oh, we do all of these mental acrobatics in our brain to do what we want to do, what we're being tempted to do. But they entice us and they drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Martin Luther, uh, Luther said, in Christianity you need three things. You need prayer. You need to talk to God. You need meditation. You need to listen to God. And you need temptation. That's what Martin Luther said. Well, talking to God... God wants a relationship with you. That's actually why Jesus came to planet Earth. He died on the cross. It's because he loves you. And he wants to know you. He wants to be your friend. You are a friend of God when you walk with Jesus. It's so awesome. So God wants you to talk to him. And some of us, uh, may, maybe you fall in this category, that your, your prayer time has become giant wish lists on Amazon with God. Well, maybe... Time, God, meditation is an important part of your Christian walk. That time when you get quiet enough that you can hear God's voice and you meditate on Him. You meditate on His Word. But why, temp why did Martin Luther say temptation? Well, temptation is a dependence on God. We need God's help in, in fighting and attacking temptation. There is always a way out. That's the fourth thing you've got to know about temptation today. There's always a way out. There's always a way out. So when you sin and you say, well, everybody's doing it, not good enough for God. If you say, God, I have no chance of resisting that temptation. It hit me like a freight train. There wasn't a moment I wasn't going to do that, God. You're lying to yourself. You're doing acrobatics in your own head to try to excuse your behavior. Because there is always a way out. And God is faithful. He's given you his word. He's given you wisdom. He's given you friends to give you advice. He always provides a lot. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, see, we're still tempted. Every single person is going to be tempted. When you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So you can endure it. Now, we got to know the Christ in me is more powerful than the temptation that the enemy wants to bring up against me. And every temptation that I endure and that I fight against is an invitation to depend on Christ and God, on God more. And God will always give you a way out. And do you remember that, um, that video game, uh, I think it was called Galactica? Or it was, it, it, we would shoot other spaceships and they would fly at you and stuff. And, and there's the video game here is you play and you, be, you be play it. and if and if the if too many ships came at one time, you could hit the hyperspace button. Remember the hyperspace button? The Spirit of God is there with us and for us. And when we are in that place and and we've done everything right as we, we could. And that temptation comes upon us and hits us hard. The Spirit of God can come in with a hyper grace button. That comes in and gives us a strength and a power that is bigger than we are. And we press on. You see, sin cannot destroy you. Because Jesus died on the cross and he paid for your sin. But if you let some pet sin to take control of your life and you allow your heart to get hard against that temptation, because see, that's the danger. That's the danger, is that we, that we get used to the sin in our life, and we're kind of like, well, I'm not as bad as that guy, so I must be okay. I'm not as bad as he is, and we let that sin fester there. And now, all of a sudden, uh, your whole Christian walk becomes muted. We are in all kinds of different places sitting here today. But my prayer is that the Holy Spirit of God would come with His conviction and that if there is sin in your life, in your life, 
He would come and he'd put his finger on it and he'd bring his conviction and he'd say, no, I don't want this for you. I love you too much. I paid too much for you to let this destroy you. Because the thing about sin is that it always kills, it always destroys. Sin, the wages of sin is death. I'm going to pray in a minute. And when I pray, I'm going to pray two things. I'm going to pray that God would come in by His Spirit and shake you up and not let you be content in your sin. Because some of us have had things in our lives so long and we've had we've been so discouraged by giving into this temptation over and over and over again, we've gotten kind of used to it. It's kind of there, it's always been there, and we're like, you know what, I'm functioning, I'm managing it, I'm managing this addiction, I'm managing this sin, I'm, it's, not, it's not destroying me. I want to tell you that the enemy, you give him that inch, and the moment that God wants to do something in your kids' lives, when you have been pushing so hard, you've been praying so hard, the moment they need you the most, the enemy's going to play that card. And he's going to hit you with that thing, and he's going to try to destroy you. The enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. He has one plan for your life, and that is to hurt you and then, then drag you and the people you love to hell. That's the enemy's plan for your life. And so if you're here today, and, and you're a Christian, maybe he doesn't need to take you in some big sin right now. Maybe he just has to bait, wait and hang out and just allow that little sin to grow and to fester into something that, because that's what, it, we read the Bible verse, it starts out small. This little sin, we allow it, but the thing is, is they grow. And sometimes by the time that sin, we realize that it's a problem, it's all grown up and it's I hate you and I'm going to kill you. So I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God to come and convict us of sin. That His Holy Spirit would come in. And I'm not going to pick on any certain sin because it's different for different ones of you. There's just too many of them. But I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit to come in and grab you and give you a shake and say, Scott, no. I got better for you than this, and I'm not willing to let you sit here anymore. The Holy Spirit has got to grab some of your hearts today, and I just pray that you would open yourself up to it right now. That you would let Him grab you and give you a shake and say, No! No more! I love my family too much to let this destroy me. I love my wife too much to let this destroy me. God, I know you love me too much to let this destroy me. God, no more. You provided a way out, and God, I'm going to find it. I don't know where it is, but I'm going to find it, and I'm going to keep on going. So I'm going to pray that the Lord would come and would convict sin. Now, that's one category person. Maybe, maybe you've gotten a little bit cozy with your sin. But maybe you're here today, and you are not cozy with your sin. Man, you hate your sin. You, you despise it. It's the thing that you think about when you come to church. It's the thing that you think about when you see your mom. It's the thing that you think about when you get around people who love Jesus. It's the thing that beats you in the forehead every time you come. It is the shame that you carry all the time. I love you today. And I am telling you that you don't have to carry that. Because sin has no power over you anymore. The pastor, what do I do? You come back to him. Because it, what it looks like is, man, you come to church, and you come to worship, and you say, Jesus, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I don't want to be that man. And he comes, and he washes you, and you have a listening experience. You're worshiping God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound it saved. And the knowledge of your sin is roaring within you, and the gratitude is bubbling out of you. And it's awesome. And then you go home that week, and you go through the week, and then something happens, and that sin comes, and, and you just do it. Man, you, you, way out? Pastor said there was a way out. God, there was no way out. I just did it. I'm talking to you today. What do we do with sin? 
that we keep on tripping up on? What about that thing that, that screams at you? Number one, you've got to come back to Jesus and you've got to give it to him and repent. Repent means to change directions. It means I was doing this, now I'm doing this. And God sees the direction of your heart. And he has no patience for us just laying in our sin. But when we come to him and we say, God, wash me, clean me, make me new, he does it. His word says he throws your sin as far as the east is from the west. There is no east pole. It just keeps going and going and going and going. And so you come, you get that listening experience where you repent, you say, God, make me clean. And then you go and you do it again. And then you come back. And you see, Christian, you've heard me say this, maturity is, isn't really sinning less. Let me tell you what Christian maturity is. It's shortening the distance between sin and sin and repentance. That's spiritual maturity. I'll take that maturity any day over someone who is just managing their sin well. Shorten the distance between sin and repentance and change direction. Because you know what's going to happen? You're going to feel like you're moving nowhere. You're going to feel like, God, I'm making three steps forward and five steps back. But then you're going to come to me a little while later and be, Pastor, I'm struggling with this. And I'm going to look at you and say, you know what? I've known you for a while now. You're growing, and you're better than you were. You used to come to me, and you're so strung out on meth that you are an idiot, and we had no hope for you. <laughs> you're here, and that's a testament to the glory and the goodness of God. This conversation I have with a guy, no, not quite, I'm paraphrasing, pretty hard. So, so strung out on meth, and today you're at the altar, and you're crying because your buddy, your next door neighbor came by with some pot. You got high last night, and now you're repenting for it. Dude, you were unemployable two years ago. See, it's hard for you to see sometimes. Spiritual maturity is not quitting sinning, because I'm still sinning. Spiritual maturity is shortening the distance between sin and repentance, and then allowing God to change. You know what's going to happen? In five years, the things that you're, that you're sinning is not going to be the same with what you're doing now. You're becoming more like Jesus. I'm never going to get there, but I strive. And the closer I get, the better it is. Because sin always hurts, it always destroys. 